Hello and welcome to Sophie and Co. I'm Sophie Shevard Nate. How did Russia and the West slip back into what seems like the Cold War all over again? And how is this standoff affecting Americans? Well, today we ask someone renowned for his insights. A man of many talents, American linguist, philosopher, cognitive scientist, political commentator and activist, a major thinker of our time. Noam Chomsky is my guest today. The United States is back in a familiar conflict. The Russians are the enemy once again. The rhetoric is heating up. The resurgent hawks are getting louder. Who benefits from the constant saber rattling? How can it be stopped? And is anyone prepared to go from words to action? Professor Noam Chomsky, world-renowned linguist, philosopher, political commentator, joining us via Skype from his MIT office. Professor, it's really great to have you with us today. Now, today U.S.-Russia relations are at a Cold War low. Rhetoric resembles what we heard in the 80s. What is the worst case scenario we could see this turn into? Can the Cold War turn hot? Does U.S. want war? The worst scenario, of course, would be a nuclear war, which would be terminal, both for the state that initiates it, which would be wiped out by the consequences and the, the, that's the worst case. And it's come ominously close several times in the past, uh, dramatically close, uh, and it could happen again, but not planned, but just by the accidental interactions that take place as has almost happened. It's worth remembering that uh, just one century ago, the First World War broke out through a series of such uh, accidental interchanges. Uh, the First World War was horrifying enough, but uh, the current reenactment of it means the end of the human race. President Obama came to power promising to work towards complete global nuclear disarmament. Well, now there is plans to spend $1 trillion on nuclear arms in the next 30 years. But with major powers only acquiring more nukes, it's only obvious that there, the others will want as well. So could we see the nuclear non-proliferation regime crumble in the near future? We can think back as far as 1955, when uh, Bertrand Russell and uh, Albert Einstein uh, produced a uh, an appeal, a joint appeal to the people of the world in which they said to all of us, uh, you have a choice that is stark, unavoidable. Uh, the question is, will you uh, eliminate war or will you eliminate the human race? So those are your choices. And uh, we've come awfully close several times since. The missile crisis in 1962 was uh, described by Kennedy's associate historian Arthur Schlesinger as uh, the most dangerous moment in history. It was quite bright. It came very close to nuclear war. There have been many cases, not that serious, but pretty close, where a few minutes, human intervention with a few minutes. Uh, choice has prevented a nuclear war. You can't guarantee that that's going to continue. Uh, may not be a high probability each time, but if you play a game like that with uh, low probability risks, risks of disaster over and over again, you're going to lose. And now, especially in the crisis over Ukraine and the so-called missile defense systems uh, near the borders of Russia, it's uh, it's a threatening situation. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor, U.S. Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel said the U.S. needs to deal with Russia's army on NATO's doorstep. But as you yourself put it, America's red lines are firmly placed at Russia's borders. What are American red lines doing on Russia's borders? Well, that, his statement was interesting. Of course, he's correct. But NATO's borders have been expanded to reach Russia's borders. And this takes us back to uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union around 1990. Uh, 
Uh, there was an agreement between Gorbachev and President Bush, Bush number one, that uh, NATO would not expand one inch to the east. That meant to East Germany. That was the agreement. Uh, as soon as the agreement was made, NATO was expanded to East Germany. But Gorbachev was naturally infuriated, but he was informed by President Bush and his Secretary of State, James Baker, that this was only a verbal agreement. There was nothing on paper, which is true. There was nothing on paper. And uh, Gorbachev had no choice but to accept it. And President Clinton came along, next president, and within a couple of years, they expanded NATO even further. In fact, one might ask why NATO even continued to exist. Uh, the official justification for NATO was that its uh, goal, its purpose was to defend Western Europe from uh, Russian hordes who might attack uh, Western Europe. You can ask how plausible that explanation was, but at least that was the official explanation. Well, 1990, 1991, no Russian hordes. Uh, natural conclusion, okay, let's disband NATO. The opposite happened. NATO expanded. Its mission changed. The official mission of NATO, official, became to uh, control uh, the international, the global energy system, sea lanes and pipelines. That means to control the world. And of course, it's a US run intervention force, as in uh, um, Kosovo and, and Serbia in 1999. U.S. run intervention force. That's the new NATO, and it did expand to Russian borders. So, Abel is correct that uh, Russia is on NATO's borders. But, uh, it's as if uh, the Warsaw Pact had expanded to Mexico and Canada, and then uh, you know, the Russian premier said, well, uh, the United States is on the Warsaw Pact's borders, which would have been true, but a little bit misleading. <laughs> uh, you know, watching and reading the U.S. media, it's hard not to be surprised at the calls for war in one form or another. I mean, there are wordings like red lines, no options off the table, lethal aid, troops on the ground, and all of this is presented like it's no big deal. And not only in the press, but by the government officials as well. Now, you are a scientist of words, of mind. You, you are, you know, a political activist. What do you make of it? Why are make Americans apparently so ready to go to war? Well, I don't think they're ready to go to war, but uh, the, the commitment to sort of control the world is very strong and pretty natural. After all, this is the one global superpower. And this incidentally goes way back. Uh, so the peak of American power uh, in history was around 1945. In 1945, uh, the United States literally had half the world's wealth. Uh, and very naturally, American leaders uh, wanted to uh, design and organize a world system which would uh, benefit uh, primary uh, uh, domestic uh, centers of power. That essentially means the U.S. Corp corporate system. Uh, the origins of the multinational corporation began to develop at that time, abetted by the Marshall Plan and so on. And there were detailed plans for assigning to every part of the world their, what was called their function within the global system. That began to collapse very quickly. There's a lot of talk these days about American de decline, which is correct, but it's rarely recognized that the decline began at once. Uh, in 1949, uh, there was a serious blow to U.S. global hegemony, China's independence. There's a name for that in U.S. history and Western history. It's called the loss of China. But just think about that phrase for a minute loss of China. I mean, I, I can lose my computer. I can't lose your computer, right? I can only lose what I own. And the assumption, the tacit assumption is we own China. We own the world. 
So if any part of it becomes independent, there's the loss of China or the loss of Indochina, the loss of the Middle East and so on. However, it's worth recognizing, going back to your comment, that there is criticism of this in very uh, uh, prestigious places. So the leading establishment journal in the United States is Foreign Affairs, the journal of the Council on Foreign Relations. That's as central to the really dominant establishment as you can get. Now, their last issue, uh, the lead issue advertised letters on the front page, uh, was an article by a well-known international relations specialist, John Mearsheimer, with the headline something like, uh, the West is responsible for the crisis in Ukraine. And it's a critique of Western, meaning U.S. policy that has driven things to the point where there is a serious crisis in Ukraine, a crisis that, as Mearsheimer points out, uh, seriously affects uh, Russian geostrategic concerns and would do so no matter who was in charge of Russia just because of the geostrategic nature of the uh, of the circumstances. Well, that's right in the main uh, establishment journal of the lead article. So it's not that this is going on without critical discussion. There's some. Not enough, I think, but some. Professor Chomsky, we're going to take a short break right now. When we're going to come back, we'll continue talking to world-renowned academic Noam Chomsky. Stay with us. Professor Noam Chomsky, philosopher, cognitive scientist, political commentator, joining us via Skype from Boston. Welcome back to the show. Russia's Vladimir Putin says the West can't isolate Russia through confrontation and sanctions. What do you think? Is he right? It can't isolate Russia. It could cause serious harm to Russia, but, of course, but what it's likely to do, and it's beginning to do, I'm not the only one to point this out because it's obvious, but what it's doing is driving Russia towards the east, towards uh, closer relations with China. Uh, there's plenty of hostility way back between China and Russia, but there are also some common interests. And the sanctions and other pressures against Russia are almost compelling Russia to move towards closer relations with China. China is the center of the what's called the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, uh, a, a, a very substantial international system based in China, which includes uh, India, includes Russia, includes Pakistan, includes the Central Asian states, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, and others, a uh, big international system. The current U.S. policy is driving Russia towards closer interaction with this Chinese-based system. Uh, in this uh, interaction, Russia is actually the weaker part, so it's making concessions. Uh, but the U.S. is openly uh, creating a system of power uh, which could uh, be a, which could significantly diminish uh, U.S. domination in the world. So this is a confrontation that's going on all over. It's part of uh, Obama's uh, pivot to Asia. Uh, there's a Trans-Pacific Partnership, so-called the huge commercial treaty designed to incorporate the Asian countries, not China, but the other Asian countries, crucially not China, uh, including uh, Japan, uh, Australia, uh, probably India, uh, the uh, Southern Hemisphere, Chile, and Brazil, and so on, in a, an enormous uh, trade pact. Uh, exactly what it is, we don't know, because it's being kept secret. These things are negotiated in secret, then given to the uh, parliaments to sign yes or no, meaning yes, no, no discussion, no choices. So it's not a sure thing by any means, but that's the plan. And it's the uh, kind of economic counterpart to the military the pivot to Asia and the sanctions on Russia are helping to create a counter force uh, based in 
the Shanghai Cooperation Organization or an extension of it, which will include Russia, and uh, may uh, begin to move into across the Eurasia, the whole Eurasian region, first to Turkey, then to parts of uh, Western Europe, which have their own uh, close relations with uh, Russia and the East, Germany in particular. I think those are things that are developing, but as and the sanctions are part of it. Professor, I want to talk about the crisis around ISIS a little bit. You've said that the appearance of ISIS and the spread of extremism is a natural consequence of U.S. actions in Iraq. But the emergence of ISIS seemed a surprise to all. How did U.S. intelligence miss it? Well, I'd suggest that you uh, look up on the Internet a recent article by Graham Fuller. He's a very highly regarded uh, commentator on Middle Eastern affairs, coming straight out of the U.S. establishment, a long background in the CIA as an analysis, and a uh, highly respected and very knowledgeable commentator. Uh, what he says is, I'm quoting him, the United States created ISIS. And then he goes on to say the U.S. didn't plan ISIS, of course, and isn't implementing it. Those conspiracy tales have no basis, but the U.S. Uh, actions in the region, particularly the invasion of Iraq, that created the circumstances under which ISIS emerged. And I think he's correct. Uh, what happened is uh, the U.S. basically hit Iraq with a kind of a sledgehammer. The U.S. forces instantly instituted a governmental structure which was sectarian in nature. In particular, uh, there were the Paul Bremer, the kind of uh, viceroy of Iraq, uh, designed a system in which there were uh, particular participation by Shiites and Sunni uh, in uh, various proportions, but it had to be divided that way. Uh, that, along with the counterinsurgency operations, was, of course, resistance to the invasion which the counterinsurgency operations, as always, were very brutal and destructive. But all of this came together to create sectarian conflicts, which had not existed before. If you look at Baghdad in 2000, the Shiites and Sunni were intermarried, living in the same areas. They often didn't even know who's a Sunni and who's a Shiite. It's kind of like knowing that which Protestant sect your neighbor belongs to, you may not know and you may not care. Um, you look at Baghdad 10 years later, five years later, it's uh, broken up into separate regions, walled off from one another, brutal military conflicts, uh, much of the population expelled. Uh, that has since expanded. By now it's tearing the whole region apart. Uh, Syria is one element of it. The uh, Iran-Saudi uh, confrontation is another aspect of it. And out of this emerged ISIS. Uh, Graham Fuller is quite, quite correct. You just quoted a man that you respect a lot who said that it's the United States who involuntarily uh, actually created ISIS. So if it's the U United States actions that brought about ISIS, isn't it only fair that the United States should lead the fight against it today? I mean, it's only obvious the political and diplomatic means to solve this mess aren't there. So do you support there, the U.S.-led bombing campaign? You, there are ways to respond diplomatically. The one conceivable possibility, conceivable, is to act in accordance with the law. There is rain, a reign of international law that's the principle. It uh, bars the use of force or the threat of force in international affairs, except under authorization by the UN Security Council. A law-abiding state would go to the Security Council, uh, ask for a declaration by the Security Council of a threat to peace and request the Security Council to organize and direct a response to it. And that could be done. The U.S. could then participate in it, but so could Iran. Remember, uh, you, you look at the Iraqi Foreign Office, what they want is for uh, 
uh, Iran to become involved. It's a major military force. It, if it did enter, it would probably wipe out ISIS in no time. But the U.S. won't permit that. The U.S.-run coalition, which is, which is in violation of uh, international, basic international law, excludes Iran, excludes the PKK and its affiliates, which apparently are doing the ground fighting. According to the U.S., they're a terrorist group. Uh, Turkey, which is the closest U.S. ally, is opposed to them. Uh, the central U.S. ally, Saudi Arabia, is actually the, uh, that's been the source of both the funding, the main source for the funding of ISIS, uh, but also it's the ideological source. It's the uh, Wahhabi Salafi extremist is radical Islamic doctrines, of, which are kind of a kind of a fringe of Islam, like Saudi Arabia, a fringe of that radical doctrine is ISIS. So this coalition is, you know, it's a, it, it's kind of a meaningless coalition apart from being illegal. There would be ways of handling the, of at least approaching the problem legally, which could work. Mm -hmm. And just my final question um, on a different topic. The FBI is now looking into an apparent second Edward Snowden, but previous whistleblower revelations have failed to make any real dent in the system. Why would this be any different? Talking about NSA spying isn't stopping NSA spying. It's not stopping NSA spying. It's not stopping the spying being done by Britain. Uh, the spying being done by France, uh, the spying being done by other countries, I'm sure Russia's doing it. Uh, states are very resistant to uh, uh, interference with their powers. Uh, it, of course, the NSA system, the U.S. is far and away the technologically most advanced country in the world, so it's more extensive in the United States, but uh, uh, it's duplicated in China and Britain. Russia, no doubt, uh, other countries. And yes, you're right, it hasn't stopped. Well, in fact, it's expanded. Uh, that's uh, it's a, it's a real major attack on human rights. And the th major threat is that if it becomes sort of tacitly accepted because of the fact that it's not stopped, it's just going to go on. Uh, it will go on to the point where there are literally uh, you know, tiny drones, fly-sized drones, uh, that can be on the ceiling of your living room, uh, listening to what you're saying and sending it back to the central government office. Now, there are no limits to this. Already, if you have a cell phone, even if it's off, uh, you can be uh, tracked by uh, NSA and other technologies. So this is a really dangerous development. Snowden made a major contribution by exposing it, but there's a long way to go. There has to be a citizen reaction in which will put an end to this practice. Professor Chomsky, thank you so much for this interview. Uh, we were talking to world-renowned academic, American linguist, thinker, activist, Noam Chomsky, talking about what's in store for Russia-US relationships, also crisis around ISIS, and uh, is the next whistleblower uh, scandal going to be any different than Edward Snowden? Thanks a lot for this interview. That's it for this edition of Sophie & Co. We'll see you next time.